Hello everyone, I'm Jessie with Grow Nebraska. Welcome to December's third Thursday with Kathleen Fox. I'll let Kathleen introduce herself here shortly. In the meantime, I have just a couple of housekeeping items. Mark your calendars for next year's Marketech Conference. Registration is now open and we have speakers from across the country. If you were fortunate enough to be at this year's, you'll know exactly why we're telling people to get registered now. We will more than likely sell out this year. So April 15th, 2020, get it on your calendars. This is also just to let you guys know, we are a Grow With Google High Impact Partner. If you need help with anything Google related, please message us. Um, my email will be at the end of this presentation for you. This month's featured Grow Nebraska member is SCORE Omaha. Since 1964, SCORE's seasoned business experts have provided the highest level of business counseling services to help entrepreneurs create and grow their business. SCORE is the leading source of ongoing small business counseling, business training workshops, and online expert business resources in Omaha, Nebraska, and throughout the U.S. Don't forget to mark your calendars for next month's free T3 training with Don Osborne from DBO Digital Marketing. He'll be discussing marketing for people who hate marketing. To get to that, you just go to the Grow Nebraska website under the trainings tab, upcoming trainings, scroll down and register. Now it's time for the woman of the hour. I am going to um, let Kathleen introduce herself here in a second, just so you guys know, this is a casual webinar today. If you have any questions while Kathleen is presenting, raise your hand, chat directly to me or the group, and we'll get it answered as Kathleen is discussing that topic. If there isn't time to answer your question, our contact will be available at the end of the presentation. Kathleen, I'll let you take it away. Please give us a brief introduction before you get rolling. All right, thank you. Can you hear me fine? Absolutely. Perfect, thank you. All right, good afternoon. I'd like to first thank Janelle, Jesse, and Grow Nebraska for the opportunity to be with you today and to present some important information and updates from the Internal Revenue Service. As Jesse said, my name is Kathleen Fox and I work in the Communications and Outreach Division. I've been with the IRS for 19 years and I have experience in customer service, accounts management, and examination in addition to communications. I'm going, I'm sorry, I'm going to cover a number of items today, so let's just jump right in. These are the topics that I will cover, some in more detail than others, but you can find additional information on all topics, along with much more at everyone's favorite website, irs.gov. Let's begin with our first topic, IRS letters and notices. I'm sure you'll all agree that getting an IRS letter in the mail can be a little scary, especially if you don't know why or what to do about it. IRS letters or notices typically are about a specific issue on a federal tax return or tax account and include specific instructions on what you need to do. This next slide gives, pro provides guidance on some of those concerns. First, Read the notice carefully. If your return was changed, compare the information in the letter to the original return. If you agree with the changes, follow the guidance provided to acknowledge that. If you don't agree, it's important to respond within the time frame given in the letter. You should write to explain why you disagree and explain or provide any information or documents that you want the IRS to consider. Mail your reply to the address shown in the upper left-hand corner of the notice and include any tear-off response page if one is included. It's important to keep copies of all correspondence and allow at least 30 days for a response. If you owe money, pay as much as possible even if you can't pay in full. Call the contact number on the notice for more information and be sure you have the notice you received as well as a copy of your tax return available when you call. Now this next slide shows the search term and web address for more information. Understanding your IRS notice or letter on irs.gov search term will bring you to all that information as well as the link that you see on the screen. 
Now on to a brief summary of the secure access process. Having an online account at IRS can provide access to self-help tools like getting a transcript or looking at your account. I have recorded step-by-step -step instructions for setting up an online account in a separate document that will be avail available to you after this presentation has been shared. For today, we're going to move on to the new 2020 W-4. Now let's talk a little bit about that new W-4. Here's a screenshot of section one. Whether you are an employee or an employer, the new 2020 version has several changes that you may need to be aware of. First, withholding allowances are no longer used for the redesigned Form W-4. In the past, the value of a withholding allowance was tied to your personal exemption. And of course, as part of tax reform, we no longer claim personal exemptions or dependency exemptions. Um, to reflect this change, the name of the form actually changed. It's now Form W-4, Employees Withholding Certificate. Second, the form itself is now almost a full page with a lot of white space and bigger font. It's much easier to read and to use. All instructions and worksheets have been moved to a separate document and also use a much larger font and document design principles to make them easier to use. Finally, the form is now broken down into five easy steps to make it as straightforward and easy as possible to complete. We'll go through those steps starting with step one, as you can see here. Step one contains the basic personal information, such as name, address, and likely filing status. Everyone has to complete step one. Notice qualifying widow and widower will check the same box as married filing jointly. Second, the notes there at the bottom for steps two through four now refer the taxpayer to the instructions for privacy concerns or information to claim an exemption from withholding. On to step two. So step two is not completed by everyone. This step is primarily for people who work more than one job at a time or who have a spouse who is also working a job at the same time they are. This step is necessary to make sure you have enough withholding. Tax rates are progressive and increase as income increases. But the standard deduction is fixed and it doesn't change regardless of income level or the number of jobs in the household. So the total amount that should be withheld if you look at all the income coming into the household together is larger than it would be if you were considering each job separately. Now, none of that is new. It wasn't a result of anything that tax reform did. It was previously accounted for using some of those worksheets I mentioned earlier that were many times overlooked. There are three different options in this step and which option you choose depends on the number of jobs in the household and the complexity of your tax situation. The first option provides the maximum accuracy and privacy and that's simply to use the new online withholding estimator to figure the amount that should be withheld and then you enter that amount on step 4C. If you don't have access to that online calculator, you can achieve, achieve roughly the same result using the worksheets and the instructions. And again, entering that result on step 4C of the Form W-4. The final option, if there are only two jobs in the household and both jobs have similar income levels, you can just simply check the box on step 2C. The effect of that is to split the standard deduction and the tax brackets equally between the two jobs. Now you'll need to check that box on W-4s for both jobs. And that's slightly less accurate than the other two options, but it is clearly the simplest option. All you have to do is check a box. We'll cover steps three and four on the next slide. The next two steps are again not completed by everyone. 
These steps are only for taxpayers who need to adjust their withholding to reflect tax credits, income that isn't normally withheld on, deductions beyond the standard deduction, and unusual situations like that. Step three is designed specifically to allow for withholding tax credits. As you can see, you calculate the child tax credit and credit for dependents directly on the form. You can also add in the amount of any other credits that you estimate you would take. Step four allows employees to make adjustments to their withholding for those situations that I mentioned, investment income or adjustments to income. Step 4A is for the additional income, and that's going to actually increase your withholding. Step 4B is the itemized, itemized deductions or adjustments to income that would decrease your withholding. And step 4C, I mentioned a few times in connection with step two, is just the line that you can use to indicate I want to increase my withholding for whatever reason. One of those reasons would be multiple jobs. So you might be wondering how do these changes to the Form W-4 impact employees? Well, current employees are not required to complete a new Form W-4 just because the form was redesigned. But we do strongly encourage it for two reasons. First, the new design is going to provide a more accurate result which should help to avoid any penalties for being underwithheld. And if they're overwithheld, they can make any necessary changes to get cash quicker throughout the year. And second, due to changes in tax reform, we're encouraging everyone to do a paycheck checkup to make sure that their withholding is still appropriate for their situation. The IRS recently introduced a great tool for checking your withholding and that's the Tax Withholding Estimator on irs.gov. The estimator is more user-friendly and covers a broader set of circumstances than the old withholding tax calculator, which you may have been familiar with. It does not ask for personally identifiable information and can be completed quickly and easily as your circumstances change. It's mobile-friendly and has a progress tracker. It has built-in browser links to determine your eligibility for credits and deductions. It has enhanced results screen, so there's really no reason why you wouldn't be able to use that to quickly validate the withholding number that you have right now. The only caveat I would make to that is if you have a very complex tax situation, you might still want to use the worksheets in Publication 505. So for instance, if you're subject to alternative minimum tax or something that isn't accounted for with the estimator. So the final step on the next slide contains the signature block. For those of you who are employers, you might be wondering how does all this impact you? Well, employers are going to have the situation where some employees may be keeping their old form W-4 or filing a new W-4. And certainly any employees beginning after January 1, we'll have to use the new Form W-4. So they can, as an employer, you can either use two separate systems to handle those new and old forms to calculate withholding, or you can have a single system based on the new form that addresses both. Publication 15T and Frequently Asked Questions on the new Form W-4 at irs.gov explain how this can be done, as well as other information that can be helpful with the transition to the new form. As a reminder, the form we just reviewed is for 2020. It's not the current Form W-4. Although there are only a couple more weeks of 2019, taxpayers should continue to use the 2019 Form W-4 until January 1st, 2020. So now that we've summarized the changes to Form W-4 and emphasized the importance of doing a paycheck checkup to avoid surprises and complications when preparing your return at the end of the year, let's take a quick look at the withholding estimator. As I mentioned earlier, we have made changes to the tax withholding estimator to make that tool more friendly. We changed the look and feel to make it more consistent with irs.gov 
the online account, and other online applications. We added helpful headers, making it easy for users to understand the phases or steps. And previously, you were not able to go back or change any input once you left a page. But now you can move back and forth between pages. You can go back and see what you input. You can make changes. It's much more user friendly. More taxpayers can use the estimator. The previous version did not allow for things like social security income or self-employment income, and now the estimator includes those. It does not ask for personally identifiable information, and it does not retain any information that you input. It contains links for determining eligibility for credits and deductions, but again, it is still not for those with complicated tax situations. You would use publication 505. The next slide skips right to the final page, the results. This is a screenshot of the final page. The tax withholding estimator improvements make the results page much easier to read and to understand. The results are shown in both text and visual. There's also a summary of the information that you entered. It's below what you can see on the screenshot, but it is part of this page you just scroll down. And it's a good idea to print this page and keep it with your tax records. Now, next up is the new form 1040 SR. If you complete your return online using tax preparation software, you probably won't see or notice any changes electronically. And it really is for seniors who file paper forms. The Bipartisan Budget Act of 2019 mandated that the IRS create a form specifically for seniors. So taxpayers 65 or older will have the option to use this new form when they file their 2019 federal income tax return. The Form 1040 SR allows for specific types of income like capital gains and retirement benefits and it's available without regard to the amount of total income and there's more on the next slide retirement is not a requirement taxpayers working past the age of 65 will still have the option to file the form 1040 sr they also have the option to use the form 1040 sr if they choose to itemize now we made changes to readability, like removing the shading to make it easier on the eyes and using a larger font. We also included the standard deduction chart right on the form. And that allows taxpayers who are 65 or older to calculate their additional standard deduction without having to refer to the instructions. In the past, many taxpayers who qualified for that additional standard deduction did not take it because they weren't aware to look for it in the instructions. Now, in another step to help simplify the form, we made changes to the schedules. Let's take a look at those now. You might recall schedules one through six were introduced last year as part of the building block approach. Well, we received many comments about the number of schedules and the resulting number of pages when you printed your return. So due to that, we've reduced schedules from six to three. Schedule one is for income items. Schedule two is taxes. And schedule three is additional credits and payments. And we've moved the foreign address and third party designee back to the form 1040. We also renumbered the schedules so that each schedule begins with line one instead of its traditional line numbering. And that was always the plan. It was just for programming purposes that we needed to retain the traditional line numbering for the first year. But now you'll no longer be confused about why am I starting on line 40 on the schedule. That was a little challenging last year. On schedule one, we added an entry space for the date of divorce or separation on alimony lines. And that's due to another change from tax reform that just became effective this year, which controls when alimony is includable in income and when it's deductible by the person who paid it. Specifically, the person who paid the alimony will no longer get a deduction, 
and the recipient will no longer have to claim the income for payments made due to a divorce or separation agreement that is executed after December 31st, 2018. We've also added a virtual currency question to Schedule 1. So taxpayers who file Schedule 1 to report income or adjustments to income that can't be entered directly on Form 1040 should check the appropriate box to answer the virtual currency question. Now, taxpayers do not need to file Schedule 1 if their answer to the question is no and they don't have any other reason to file Schedule 1. We also removed the line for sh the shared responsibility payment from Schedule 2. That again was permanently zeroed out as part of, as part of tax reform that was effective this year. Now let's talk a little bit about IP pins. An IP pin helps us verify a taxpayer's identity and accept their electronic or paper tax return. When you have an IP pin, it prevents someone else from filing a tax return with your social security number. If a return is e-filed with your social security number and an incorrect or missing IP pin, our system will reject it until you submit it with a correct IP pin or you file on paper. If the same conditions occur on a paper filed return, we delay processing for your protection while we determine if it's yours. The IP pin also will serve as the taxpayer's electronic signature on the return. So currently we ask for either a self-select pin or a preparer pin, affirming that the information on the return is accurate. But the IP pin serves as an alternative signature, saving time for both the taxpayer and the tax preparer. This next screen shows the three ways to get an IP pin. The IRS will issue an IP pin to a taxpayer if they are a confirmed victim of tax-related identity theft and their case has been resolved. We will mail the taxpayer an acknowledgement that states their case has been resolved and they can either access an IP pin online or wait until the following January and receive their IP pin by mail. In this example, the confirmed victim has the option of obtaining an IP pin immediately by using that acknowledgement and going to IP pin, get IP pin online immediately, or they can wait and get their IP pin mailed to them in January by mail. For taxpayers who may be a victim of identity theft, but not tax related identity theft, there is an option to submit a form 14039, which is an identity theft affidavit, and check box two to indicate that there is no tax administration impact. Once the affidavit has been processed, the IRS will mail an acknowledgement to the taxpayer. And with this acknowledgement, the taxpayer can use the get an IP pin tool at irs.gov. Now this is their only option to obtain an IP pin. The IRS will not mail them an IP pin. And finally, the IRS has been testing ways to allow any taxpayer who wants an IP pin to get one without filing the affidavit form 14039. We've been expanding the IP pin based on state residency. Now eventually we'll consider expanding IP pin eligibility nationwide but first we need to test the demands on our systems. So taxpayers residing in the test state shown here can use the get an IP pin tool on irs.gov. This is their only option. If they cannot pass the identity proofing requirements, there is currently no other option to obtain an IP pin by calling or by mailing. Now these locations represent the top 10 places for general identity theft reports to the Federal Trade Commission. That's why those 10 states are the ones that were selected. Now the next topic is making payments. If there is a balance due on a tax return, paying electronically is a convenient way to pay. There are options for initiating payments online, by phone, 
or from a mobile device. The IRS uses the latest encryption technology, so paying electronically is safe and secure. When you use any of the IRS electronic payment option, it puts you in control and gives you peace of mind. Payments can be scheduled in advance and you'll receive confirmation after it's submitted. It's quick, easy, secure, and much faster than mailing in a check or money order. The IRS electronic payment options are available on our payments page and at the irs to go app. The next option is electronic funds withdrawal. Electronic funds withdrawal is an integrated, excuse me, an integrated e-file e-pay option offered only when filing federal taxes using tax preparation software. Using this payment option, you can submit one or more payment requests for direct debit from a designated bank account. And that is the electronic funds withdrawal. And now we'll move to direct pay. Not only can you use this method to pay the balance due on most business and personal tax returns when filing them electronically, but when filing a current year 1040, you can also schedule electronic funds withdrawal for any estimated tax payments. If you file before the due date of the return, you can schedule the withdrawal for any day up to the return due date. After the due date, the payment date must be the same as the date the return is transmitted. Once the return is accepted, information pertaining to the payment, such as account information, payment date or amount cannot be changed. If changes are needed, the only option is to cancel the payment and choose another payment method. Cancellation requests must be received two business days prior to the scheduled payment date. And there's two things to remember. Electronic funds withdrawal can only be scheduled while electronically filing a return. Your tax preparation software will prompt you for necessary information if you choose this option. Federal tax deposits cannot be made using this option. And now we'll look at the electronic option that you can use anytime. If you're an individual taxpayer, the IRS Direct Pay offers you a free, secure electronic payment method. Taxpayers must have a valid social security number or individual taxpayer identification number to use direct pay. The application does not accommodate employer identification numbers or EINs. Taxpayers receive immediate confirmation after they submit their payments. There's no pre-registration required to use direct pay and payments can be set up in a single session of five easy steps. Now let's move to the landing page that shows how to get started. Again, there is no cost and taxpayers receive instant confirmation that their payment has been scheduled. You can find direct pay on the IRS website at irs.gov direct pay. Unlike EFTPS, no pre-registration is required. To begin, you click on make a payment. Moving on to another payment option, if you prefer to pay by credit card or debit card, we have an option for that too. Just click on pay by card from our payments page. We can see the benefits of this option on the next slide. This option can be used to pay by internet, phone, or mobile device using the IRS to go app. And this option is available whether you e-file, paper file, or are responding to a bill or notice. It's safe and secure. The IRS uses standard service providers and business commercial card networks. Taxpayer information is used solely to process their payment. And the payment processors are shown on this next slide. There are three of those processors to choose from. The service provider does charge a fee and the fees may vary depending on the provider you select. Also, if you choose to pay by card, when you e-file, 
the fees may be different from those in the table above. There's a link on pay by card page that will take you to the specific fees for the integrated e-file and e-pay option. There are several things to be aware of when paying with a debit or credit card. The card statement will list this payment as the United States Treasury tax payment. The convenience fee paid to the provider will be listed as tax payment convenience fee or something similar. You usually can't cancel payments. And while you can pay both business and individual taxes by credit or debit card, not all IRS tax forms are eligible and there are limits on how often you can make payments. You'll want to review the frequency limit table by type of tax payment before choosing this option. And the link to this information is on the pay by card page. Just like electronic funds withdrawal and direct pay, you cannot make federal tax deposits using this method. Now let's talk about the EFTPS. Electronic Federal Tax Payment System is Treasury's free service for paying federal taxes for individuals and businesses. Although it's the only way to pay federal tax deposits, you can pay just about any federal tax using EFTPS. And here are some benefits. It's quick, secure, and accurate. It's available by phone or online 24 seven. You can schedule business and individual payments up to 365 days in advance. EFTPS is a two-step process. Step one is enrollment. You go to EFTPS.gov, select enrollment, then you need to select business or individual and enter the requested information, which is your taxpayer identification number. And it's the employer identification number if you're enrolling as a business or your social security number if you're enrolling as an individual. You provide your bank account number and routing number, address and name as they appear on your current IRS tax documents, and then click submit. In five to seven business days, you'll receive your PIN in the mail. So if you need to make payments through EFTPS, you need to plan ahead. If you're going to make payments using the online application, you need an internet password in addition to the PIN you receive in the mail. Step two, verify identity and create internet password. Once you receive your PIN, go to eftps.gov and click on login. Then click on need a password. Enter your EIN or SN, SSN, and the PIN that you received in the mail. You verify your bank information and select next, and then create your new internet password. Now remember, the account is tied to the tax identification number that you used when you were enrolling. So if you're paying both individual and business taxes with EFTPS, you will need to set up two separate accounts, one for each tax number. To make your payment, you go to EFTPS.gov and select Make a Payment. Log in and use your tax identification number, PIN, and the password that you set up. Enter the payment information in the step by step screen. When you're finished, you save a copy of the payment confirmation page. This contains your EFT acknowledgement number, and that acts as your confirmation for your payment instructions. If you don't want to make your payment online, you can call the toll-free number and schedule your payment using the EFTPS voice response system. Both payment methods, methods are interchangeable. For business taxpayers, payment instructions must be submitted to EFTPS by 8 p.m. Eastern Time at least one calendar day in advance of the due date. You can schedule your payments up to 365 days in advance, and funds will not move from your account until the date you indicate. For individual taxpayers, payment instructions can be submitted on the same day up to 11.45 p.m. Eastern Time and receive credit for the same day payment. 
You can schedule your payments up to 365 days in advance. And again, funds will not move from your account until the date you indicate. Business and individuals will receive an immediate acknowledgement of your payment instructions and your bank statement will confirm the payment was made. You can check up to 16 months of EFTPS payment history online or by phone. Scheduled payments can also be changed or canceled up to two business days in advance of the scheduled payment date. This slide is the welcome page. And for more information on the EFTPS system, go to the EFTPS.gov and click on the Frequently Asked Questions or the Help and Information tab. There are downloadable materials, including a payment instruction book. Frequently Asked Questions cover topics like how do I change my banking information or how do I monitor my payment history if I outsource my payroll. So let's now move to cash payments. The quickest and easiest way to make a tax payment is online. But if you prefer to pay in cash, the IRS offers a way to pay taxes at a participating retail store. Specific details and instructions are on our payments page under the link for cash at a retail partner. But here's a basic overview. It generally takes five to seven business days to process a payment using this method. So be sure to plan ahead of any due date to ensure the payment is posted timely. To start the process, visit irs.gov slash paywithcash and follow the instructions to make a cash payment with Pay Near Me. The taxpayer will receive an email from official payments confirming the information. And that's confirming your identity and the payment information. The IRS will then verify that information. This process can take two to three days. After the IRS verifies the information, Pay Near Me will send an email with a link to a payment code and instructions. At that point, you can either print the payment code or send it to your smartphone. And as a final step, go to the retail store listed in the Pay Near Me email and ask the clerk to scan or enter the payment code. You'll receive a receipt from the store after they accept your cash. This receipt is confirmation of payment and should be kept for your records. It usually takes two business days for your payment to post to your account. Now, some things to note, there is a fee of $3.99 per payment. Payments are limited to $1,000 per day. And just like with pay with card option, not all IRS tax forms are eligible, and there are limits on how often you can make payments, depending on the form. You'll want to review this information before choosing this option. And there is a link on the Pay With Cash as a, real as a Retail Partner page. Next is one of the most common forms of payment, payment by check or money order. Taxpayers can still pay by check or money order, but before submitting a payment through the mail, please consider the alternative methods. One of the safe, quick, and easy electronic payment options we've mentioned might be right for you. But if you choose to mail a tax payment, make sure the check, money order, or cashier's check is payable to the United States Treasury. Enter the amount using all numbers. You want to send the payment with a voucher, return, or notice. But please do not use staples or paper clips to affix your payment to the document. Make sure the check or money order includes the information shown on this slide and mail your payment to the address listed on the notice or instructions, or follow the check or money order link on the payments page for information on where to mail your payment. Remember, please do not send cash in the mail. If you need to pay with cash, you can do it at one of our Taxpayer Assistance Centers, or TAX, or use the Pay Near Me option that we just discussed. Just remember that all tax Taxpayer Assistance Centers are now appointment only. Yes, all of them. And be sure and check the services provided 
for the TAC because not all of them are authorized to take cash. You can do that by checking the list of available tax assistance centers at irs.gov. I told you that was everyone's favorite website. How many times have I said irs.gov so far? Now, let's talk about if you can't pay. If you can't pay in full, you may qualify for a payment plan. If so, you can apply online to pay off your balance due over time. Your specific tax situation will determine which payment options are available to you. Individual taxpayers can request a short-term payment plan, which is paying within 120 days or less. And individual and business taxpayers can request a long-term payment plan, which is an installment agreement, and that's paying in more than 120 days. For more information on how to apply online for a payment plan, go to irs.gov, click on the Pay tab, and go to the Can't Pay Now section. More information is also available at irisvideos.gov. The payments page at irs.gov, shown on the next slide, contains links to each of the options that we've discussed today. Just click on the silver tab at the top left of most pages on irs.gov or go to irs.gov payments. Now let's summarize the important points. Electronic payments can be made online or via the irs to go mobile app. Direct pay can only be used for individual taxes. Federal tax deposits have to be made using EFTPS system. Other taxes can be paid on EFTPS as well. Check or money orders are accepted. Make sure to make them out to the U.S. Treasury and mail to the appropriate address. And Direct pay is free, easy, and a secure way to pay. Give yourself five to seven business days if you plan to pay with cash. If you can't pay immediately, you can request an installment agreement through the pay tab on irs.gov. Now let's switch gears and talk about security. Especially this time of year when everyone seems to have a more frequent online presence with shopping and all, here are some basic steps to protect yourselves online. Use security software for computers and mobile phones and keep that software updated. You protect your personal information. Use strong and unique passwords. Use two-factor authentication whenever it's possible. Only shop on secure websites. Make sure it says HTTPS in the web address. And back up your files. Now on to phishing. Stay informed of recent phishing scams so you don't fall victim. These email scams often pose as companies that you know and trust. They tell an urgent story to trick you into opening a link or an attachment. And keep in mind, IRS does not demand payment in a particular method, make threats, ask for personal information, or send unsolicited emails. Passwords. Creating strong passwords is critical. Here are a few ideas to help you adopt stronger passwords that can also be easier for you to remember. Use long phrases that you can remember combined with characters and numbers, like that example you see, something you can remember at 30. Use a different password for each account and don't use your email address. Again, use two-factor authentication whenever it's offered. We list some signs that might indicate a business might be a victim on the next slide. Businesses or their tax professionals should contact the IRS if they see any signs of identity theft, like an e-file return rejected, routine extensions requests being rejected, an unexpected receipt of a transcript or a notice, or failure to receive something that is expected. Contact the IRS right away if you expect and if you suspect your business has been compromised. Now I have a few resources here. You can find videos on each of the subjects that I discussed here today at irsvideos.gov or on YouTube. We also have resources in multiple languages. You can install the IRS tax calendar for businesses and self-employed to help with due dates and other reminders. 
these next two slides show a list of publications that are very helpful with starting and operating a business. And then we have handy telephone numbers. This is a really good list of important phone numbers that you should keep handy with your tax information should you need them. And then this final slide shows my contact information. Again, Kathleen Fox, IRS Stakeholder Liaison, my phone number and my email address. I thank you for your attention today. Now, I will hand it back to you, Jesse. Perfect. Thank you, Kathleen. That was all really great information. And I know a lot of you had quite a bit thrown at you today. If this is something new to you or your business. So please, if you have any questions, my contact info is on the screen now. Um, if you need help with anything from the training, please reach out. Um, if anybody has questions now, feel free to use the chat box and um, ask your questions there. Kathleen, I know I did get an email and a text um, about the same question. People were wondering, um, should they use websites like TurboTax or accountants, or does the IRS provide a really handy, slick way to file your taxes yourself? Well, uh, the IRS does not uh, recommend any specific service or preparer. Uh, however, there is a list of preparers who have taken the um, trainings through the IRS um, listed um, on our website. So if you go to um, looking for a preparer, um, you'll be able to find that information at irs.gov. Uh, just you can put in your zip code and you get uh, information on tax return preparers who have qualified through our programs um, within your area. Um, we do have, you know, forms and instructions that you can get through irs.gov, but we do not provide a service that you can file electronically through irs.gov now. Perfect. Um, Patty, great question. She asked if since the webinar is recorded, is it possible to have access to this webinar later on? Yes, we will be sending an email. This webinar will go on YouTube. Um, you guys will all get the link for registering. And then you will also have access to how to um, create your account that Kathleen said she had recorded previously for you. So we will have that already. Um, expect that within one to two business days. All right. So that's all for today. Thanks for joining the Grow Nebraska Foundation on this month's third Thursday training. Another shout out to Kathleen Fox with the IRS for being today's presenter. Have a great day and happy holidays, everyone. Thank you. Happy holidays.